Thanks for listening to Get in the Hole, your number one stop for all things in the world of golf. Watch and subscribe anywhere you get your favorite shows on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Google, and more. Just search Get in the Hole. Get in the Hole is the official golf pod of the Underground Sports Philadelphia family of podcasts. Now let's get right into the action. Here's your hosts, Steve McAvoy and Ben Piero. Philadelphia, baby, you're going to love it. Best sports fans in the world. Actually the worst, but that's what makes them the best. So, KB, Michael Block this week. Uh, Block probably, party. <laughs> you know, I was going to actually put that in the uh, in the notes, but now that you say it, I mean, we kind of have to run with it. Um, probably not to say that he, like, wasn't the best, like, story of the week. Um, I, honestly, I think he was. And I think it's possibly – it's funnier that he was the story of the week more than it was Liv getting their first championship, mm-hmm. which, like <laughs> – it's kind of funny, but also like kind of sad because Greg Norman like hyped up on Twitter so much. It was like, oh my God, what a performance. All these guys made top 10. They made top 20. 11 guys, guys like made the cut. And it was just, and, and, and everyone's like, shut up, Greg. It isn't about you. It's about Brooks. <laughs> and then everyone's like, fuck you. It's about Michael Block. I, I want to present this to you. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about Michael and, his, and how amazing his story actually is. But, um, I heard this on You Better You Bet. As you know, I'm a huge Nick Costos fan. Uh, They were talking about, and I forget how it came up, but they were talking about the all-time Chris's. And I want to ask you, who are the all-time Michaels? I mean, like, like, like we we know Jordan, we know Phelps, but like Michael Block's got to be somewhere now in the lore of Michaels. He's he's in the discussion of like just being talked about he's he's not in the he's nowhere close to the top four. Oh no 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 but like but like, like, like you want to talk the all time Michaels right we have Jordan we have Phelps we have the craft store good pull Michael Scott <laughs> all right there you go Michael Scott the, the... Uh, who did you just say Kenny Speeth that's Jordan Speeth Michael Speeth M- Michael Jordan Speeth <laughs> Honestly, bro, you you want to connect two athletes and, and make like make a make a, a elite athlete? Michael Jordan speed would be amazing. That is one hell of a wheel of fortune before and after. Speaking of speaking of which, uh, Michael B. Jordan also yes. de- de- definitely falls under the category. You would know that Michael more than anybody Fassbender. else. Big Michael Fassbender. Michael Bay. Michael Bay. Michael Bay's in there. I, I would uh, say. Let me pull up famous Michael. Famous Michaels of all time. Um, I mean Michael Jackson, but like, do, do, do we put Michael Jackson in yeah. there despite his um hundred percent his personal problems? Uh, Michael J. Fox, Michael Douglas, oh Michael Bublé, Michael Sarah. All right, this is a controversial take. He and I, I I've said this for months about about Matthew Matthew Fitzpatrick having a punchable face. I hate Michael Sarah because he has aged so terribly and he looks awful. And every time I see him, I want to literally fling rocks at him. Michael Keaton. Michael Strahan. Michael Keaton, great Batman, bad vulture. Decent vulture, great Batman. I just didn't like how, like, I think that's think that, 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 the story's not have, finished. Yeah, but they could, in my opinion, they just casted it wrong. Michael Clark Duncan. Bam. Michael Dukakis. Is it Dukakis? Tomato, tomato. <laughs> Mike Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't do the voice, but I feel like I, I kind of want to really badly. Um, there's, there's definitely a, Oh, Michael Bolton. Classic. When a man loves a woman. This is a, this is a two for one. Mike Myers. All right. Mike yeah. Myers, the actor. Michael Myers, the horror. Uh, Mike Myers, the actor, is better than Michael Myers, the horror um, character, in my opinion. You're just a Shrek fanboy. I oh, am. Duh, right in our backyard and, you know, soon to be uh, owner of Trout National, Mike Trout. Yeah, Mike Trout. I mean, hey, Michael Vick. I was going to say Michael Vick. Michael, Michael Kors. Kors. Are we looking at the We're same We're on list? the same list at this point. 
I, I well, I literally just found it. I, originally, it was like images, and now I'm here. I mean, like Mike Pence, Mike Piazza. This is this say, is a wild list. You, Mike Piazza. I love Mike Piazza. Michael, Michael Bloomberg, Irvin. classic. Michael Michael Irvin's good. I mean, we aren't a holy podcast, but like Michael the Archangel is pretty damn cool. <laughs> yeah, ask me. I mean. If you want to be semantical, know. we are a holy podcast because we are the get in the whole podcast. That's kind of a disgusting thing to say uh, at this point. I, I had a friend that actually asked me the, the other day. He goes, uh, Steve, I have a golf question. And I'm like, yeah, what's up? He goes, uh, does everyone always say get in the hole? It's kind of getting annoying. Like this kid's like this kid's only gotten into the golf probably in the last uh, month or so because he got he got the new PGA game and he's been playing it nonstop. And he's like, yo, like. Now I understand why you love golf. But he, but he asked me, he goes, uh, he goes, it, does everyone always say get in the hole? And I go, yeah. They also say like mashed potatoes. <laughs> and like my wife left me. Like, like, like they all say ridiculous stuff. Uh, and he was like, honestly, man, it's getting kind of annoying. He's watching the, uh, he's watching yesterday's round of the PGA Championship. I'm like, yeah, this is kind of just like what life is at this point in the golf world is people saying just random ass stuff to try and, uh, does you attention. know that that's actually just us advertising the podcast? Well, I then did say after after our spiel, I said, in other news, this is now your opportunity to go and follow my podcast, appropriately called, and I just linked to Spotify, and, and, and it popped up. Yeah, like it's just, yeah, that, that, that just absolutely Hearing worked. That, I actually watched uh, a bunch of Sunday, and hearing that is just music to my ears, because I it's think, like, wow. We really picked a fantastic name for free ads for life. I think it's funny because, like, how is it not taken by anybody? It's unreal. Like, so many different things that you could, like, call, call a golf podcast. Like, I think, I don't know if it's Max Homa's, some golfer. It's called, like, like breakfast balls. Mm-hmm. All right. That's good. I get it. It makes sense. But, like, get in the hole. I feel like it's because it's such a negative thing that nobody wanted to adopt it. Fine. I'll take it. I don't but mind. I, I thrive I, off negativity. <laughs> I also laugh at, at, at other people's tragedy. So, I mean, it kind of makes exactly. sense why we're, uh, why, why we're doing this. Oh, God. I mean, look, I, it, it was hilarious hearing everyone say, I think at some point, the next time I go to a tournament, which hopefully will be soon, um, every hole I go to, I, I, I will video the hole. And I will, I'll, I'm going to take everyone's yelling, get in the hole. And I'm going to clip all of them together. Yes. And we're going to make a collage. And that the will intro. eventually, that'll be the intro to the show. It'll just be constant. We'll have like a little like audio in the background. I want to hopefully also be able to pull video of like actual guys teeing off. And then, and then like, there's just some dude like behind us, behind like Tiger or swinging or somebody who just yells, get in the hole. It's just like, like it makes perfect sense. That would actually be the, like like the elite. And then once you know everything clears up, you just have business cards in hand, slinging them to everybody. Like here you go, this is what it's all about. Don't get me started on, on business cards. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna quote the uh, scene in American Psycho of Billy talking about the uh, business cards. You let's love see, that movie. Let's see Paul Allen's card. Michael Block makes history at the PGA Championship. Brooks Kepka is he an all-time player of all time? We'll see on that one. Welcome in, folks, to the Get in the Whole podcast. Stephen McAvoy, Kyle Bennett joining you, presented to you today and every day by our friends over at Wasted Wedge. A new age of golf has arrived. If you are looking to be the talk and envy of your group and create lasting memories with your friends and family, look no further than their lineup of Wasted Wedge products and merchandise. Wasted Wedge, the ultimate shot ski that you never thought you needed instead of a ski it's a golf club with your shots the wasted wedges are a blast to drink out of on and off the course check them out at wastedwedge.com or find them at wasted wedge on instagram and facebook remember folks wastedwedge.com they are the future of the shot ski industry especially in the world of golf kb welcome in to the show once again to stepping in for uh, for owen this week as we are still on the quest for a new co-host i want to give a, a a salutation and a uh a farewell to our friend jake he had to go and pursue other things of course being a lawyer by day and a podcaster by night is challenging to do but we are here back with you 
if you're looking to get involved in the golf podcasting world, please give me a call. I'm going to link my, I probably shouldn't, shouldn't link my phone number, but if I do, we'll, uh, we'll have a good time. I'm going to get a bunch of like spam calls from China t- t- telling, telling me my, my Corvette is like out of like retail. Reach like out um, on Twitter and Instagram at getting the whole pod, or you can email us underground sports, PHI at gmail.com. If you like long walks on the beach and screaming, get in the hole, this is the place for you. We start off with the lead story, not Michael Block quite yet. We're going to talk about him, but Brooks Kepka conquers Oak Hill, just like Kang the Conqueror. We now have Brooks the Conqueror. It was quite the story coming into this week. Of course, Brooks Kepka, the major whisperer. When was he going to do it? The guy happens to love the state of New York. Now a five-time major winner. I think three or four of those have all come in New York. I know he won at Beth Page Black twice, and and now he's taking home this one at Oak Hill. Just a tremendous feat for someone like Brooks, who I had this debate with somebody. Uh, I I had a phone call with somebody um, in my NIL space, and I was talking to him, and he actually led our conversation, our conversation with, is Brooks back? And I replied to him promptly, and I guarantee he was watching it. Uh, he's watching it right now. I told him, I'm like, I don't think he was ever gone. Uh, if you look back to full swing, I think this is kind of like where – the, the mantra of, oh, Brooks has lost it is, of course, when the guys jump to live, it's kind of like, it's kind of, it's like the story, like, oh, why are they doing it? And for some, yeah, it's the money. I get it. For Sergio, for Lee Westwood, for Grim Dowell, that's what it was. It was for the money. They're in their 50s. They're done. For Brooks Kepka, though, a guy who was still on top of his game when he left, like, did he really need it? Did, 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 Justin, did Dustin Johnson really need it? I mean, not for nothing. These guys have kind of done everything for their career already. They've been on Ryder Cup teams. They've won Ryder Cups. They've won President's Cups. They've won majors. They've won at least 10 tournaments apiece. So, like, at that point, did it really matter? I know DJ said it on full swing. But in Brooks's case, I think the fascinating thing was that he had his his bouts of mental health. He said, I I can't fight with these guys anymore. When I'm, when I'm sleeping, I'm dreaming about my swing and, and how bad it is. And he's dreaming and he's talking to his wife and he's like, what the fuck's wrong with me? And I think it was a fascinating thing to kind of see a, uh, a vulnerable Bruce Kafka, considering the kind of person that he already is and that you already see every single day, the big muscles, the the brawny face, the the, the F you kind of mindset. But you, th- th- there's no arguing here that Bruce Kepka never left the scene. He's always been a top 30 golfer, even when he did, did jump to live. He's always maintained that status. He's always been the guy who plays well in regular season tournaments, but always plays his best at majors. Again, five-time winner. Like, you look at what he's been able to, to do. Even disregarding, like, the, the the regular season stuff, in his last four majors, he's finished no worse than 15th. Like, the guy's always been around, and now and now that he's winning live tournaments and, and, and what he won um, the week prior to the Masters, it just goes to show you how skilled he actually is. And for literally 10 years, for, for a good time, he was the number one he was the number one player in the world for almost a year. And granted, this is back in 2018, but now with not nine that long ago. Yeah, exactly. Like these guys don't fall off the cliff that easily, especially when you're only 33 years old and still still like in your prime. Like Let's he still also has not plenty. forget with Brooks, like not only the mental stuff, like those knee injuries he had, like people thought he might just be done. Exactly. I didn't think he'd be able to bounce back from those knee injuries, let alone piling on top of what the the mental health struggle from that was along with just like trying to stay on his a game and how much the tour was like beleaguering him yeah that's a huge part of why he went to live i think dan rapaport tweeted about it like nobody knew if he was ever going to be able to play again so he goes to live to kind of get the financial security of not knowing whether or not he's going to be able to play at, at the top of his game again and i agree with you i don't think brooks has gone anywhere no, he he's he's always been here. And again, you look at his PGA Tour wins over the last what uh, ten years, D- dating back to his first win in 2015. Actually, his true first win was on the European Tour back in 2014. Um, but even then, yeah, despite the fact that he has only one, two, three, he only has four PGA Tour regular season wins. The U.S. Open in 2017 and 2018, the PGA in 2018 and 2019. Like, you, people don't do that. Tiger Woods is one of the only guys to ever do that. Jax has done it. Bruce Kepka is, is in the elite category with, like, five guys. When you look at, at the greatest ever and guys to go back-to-back in a major, especially when, when also you consider, like, it's one thing to go back-to-back in a, in a regular tournament. Like, you go play, like, the Waste Management and you go back-to-back, great, totally fine. But, like, 
the site's the same. Nothing changes at the waste management. It's always going to be TBC Scottsdale. You go to the majors and you go from Erin Hills in Wisconsin, super hilly, in, like rough weather. It was cold back then, back then in June of 2017. Then you go to Shinnecock out on the east end of Long Island. The wind is blowing in your face. The water is right there. It's, it's far different from what he dealt with, and he dominated. Then again, you go to um, the Bell Reef, another completely different golf course than when he won at Beth Page Black. And now, of course, you see it again at, at, at Oak Hill, which honestly, in, in terms of layout, I mean, look, some some courses are similar in in like in hilliness or in style. Like Oak Hill is similar to Beth Page Black. It's very hilly. It's very mobile. There's a lot of there's a lot of moving pieces. Of course, they're both in New York, so the terrain is, is rel relatively equal. Those things make sense. But the season, the the course is always changing. There's always new things going on. And I think what actually makes it more impressive was the fact that everyone going into this was like, this is never. This is something you will never see in a PGA championship. It was more like a U.S. Open, which I think was probably like – that was the one quote that I said last week that kind of like stuck out to me was the the rough was thicker. The greens were made of concrete the entire week. The – the 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 miss – not even going to say this is a word. The missability of, of both greens and fairways were so much harder than what you, you typically see – in a typical PGA championship. Also, like there were some similarities, bombers, paradises made for good drivers of a golf ball. Of course, Kepka falls into that category, but it, the, the course fit him. And I'm kind of upset that I didn't actually like call him out as somebody who, who was, was live to win this week. Um, despite most of the guys who actually did say we're going to possibly were, would be in contention were, Bruce Kepka was the one guy who kind of, who kind of slipped by and I'm, and I'm surprised I kind of missed it. He is the 20th player in men's golf history to win five major championships, and he joins Tiger and Phil as the only players to do it in the last 30 years. Exactly. Like, legend of the game. I think, I think there's, a, there's a, absolutely no doubting that, and this kind of segues into my next point that I wanted to bring up, and it's something that every podcast in the world is going to be talking about, but it's something that kind of has to be discussed all time, right? Where is he? It's a good question. Like, I, if I'm going to be honest with you, he has, nine PGA, he has nine PGA Tour wins. Honestly, if he was still on the PGA Tour, he could probably get five more wins in his career. And you know what? Fifth, like, 15, 15, 14 career wins doesn't, look, doesn't sound like a lot. Um, but, like, most guys don't get, like, five. Here's let, a, here's a fun let alone when when five of your pro wins are majors, it kind of like it, yeah. it's it's a staggering number. Here's a fun tweet from um, Albert Nugent on Twitter at Analytics Capper. Okay. Major championships: Bryson DeChambeau, Scotty Scheffler, each have one. John Rahm, JT, Colin Morikawa, Dustin Johnson all have two. Jordan Spieth has three. Rory has four. Brooks has five. Yeah. He follows that up and says. The best player in this current era, he's one major short of Phil Mickelson. He's coming. Yeah. As as much as Scotty and John Rahm and Rory and the, the every guy on that list have been in the limelight and the spotlight over the past four, five, six years on the PGA Tour, it's a hundred percent. I like if you're if you're basing and weighing how important wins, especially major wins, are. Brooks is ahead of all those guys in terms of like all time rank, you know, how much we as Americans. And I think just the sports world in general weighs a championship. The major is your equivalent to, you know, a ring and, and stuff like that in a lot of senses. I, I think Brooks is, he's, he's making his way up. And, you know, if you told me somebody said, Oh, he's top 15 all time. I'd sit and listen to the argument. I think he's 100% top 15. I think there's absolutely no doubt in my mind. You want to go through the list of, of major winners, like in order, in terms of how many they have. Of course, Jack's got 18. It's the most. I don't think anybody's going to ever break that. Tiger at 15. Walter Hagen at 11. Hogan and Player both have nine. So that right there is your technical top five if you're going only off majors, totally disregarding the idea of uh, of of overall wins. Then it's Tom Watson at eight, Sam Snead, Arnie, and Gene Sarazen at seven, 
Phil and Lee Trevino at six. And then it's literally Bruce Kepka and Byron Nelson. Byron Nelson's a top four golfer of all time, and he's tied with Brooks Kepka for majors. I, they, and, and also, this is something else, else to consider. A lot of these guys, Arnold Palmer won his last major in his last season, in his 20th season on the PGA Tour, or 19th. Brooks has done it in nine years. <laughs> like, doesn't happen all, all that often. Like, Rory McIlroy has been playing this game, game for 13 years and still and still has less. I grant, like, like, look, I, I is he I'm top not 10. Um, well, would you listen to the argument if someone presented Brooks Kepka top 10 all time? Uh, yes, solely for the reason that the majors make up more than half of his wins. I think the interesting thing about Brooks Kepka that we have to consider is that a lot of these guys who I rattled off and like, you want to talk about like career wins, right? If you were to put all of them based on majors alone um, and rank them in order, Jack's wins are 73, Tiger 82, Hagen 45, Hogan 64, player 24. Yari player has the least number of wins among those top 10 in majors, but nine of his 24 wins were majors. Like that's like staggering. Gary Player is a top is, a, is is by far a top ten, arguably top six player in the world, because of the fact that a third of his wins were majors, which is like crazy. Like I think Phil is great. Forty five wins is nothing to snuff at, but if if Brooks wins one more major, which is not out of the question, considering he finished T two at the Masters, he won this one. Only God knows what he's gonna do at, do in in, in L A. When the weather's actually nice, like what's like what's gonna happen then? You, you gotta think it, it, if Bruce Kepka wins one more major, he's a top ten. He's, he's a, he is a top ten player ever. Might even be better than like Gene Sarazen, better than Tom Watson, better than dare I say Tom Watson? Like goats of the game. And also, like something else, something else to consider. Um, there are guys with only one major victory: Davis Love, Gene Littler, Curtis Strangers, too. Like they're all in the Hall of Fame of golf. Mm-hmm. Like Brooks Koepka has already cemented. Uh, like the Hall of Fame is there; he cemented in. Yeah. Um, granted, so. granted, I think, he jumped- he, I think he was there even before this weekend. Yeah, and and, and look, it, it certainly won't be won't be the PGA Hall of Fame, uh, but the Golf Hall of Fame. If you are, if the Golf Hall of Fame is unbiased to your affiliation, he's there. Um, I mean, when we eventually conjure up the Get in the Hole Hall of Fame or whatever we decide to call it, like he's there. Yeah, he's there. And, and honestly, like he's ahead of a lot of guys. If you if you ask me today, do I take Brooks Kepka over Dustin Johnson for who gets into the Hall first? I think it's Brooks. Hundred percent. I, I will take Brooks's five majors to, to DJ's twenty four wins any yeah. day of the week. And even though DJ did his majors in a dominating fashion, I think the only player to get to hit the to, I think the the all time low score at Augusta for a major, I would still take Brooks in a heartbeat. You want to talk like Nick Price, another guy, eighteen wins, three majors. Uh, I will take Brooks Kepka. I'll take him over Ernie Els, nineteen wins and four majors. Hell, honestly, and and maybe maybe it's a stretch. But the profiles are very much similar. Rory versus Brooks, it's neck and neck. Rory has 23 wins. He has four majors. Brooks has nine wins and five majors. Almost more impressive to me if you can win the majority of your events as majors. That's just me. You just Um, sparked the way we're going to set the internet on fire this week. I'm I'm telling you, like, like embrace debate. That's going on. That's going on all the socials. Like Rory McIlroy is a incredible player, and he was the number one player in the world for double the amount of time that Brooks was. Mm-hmm. However, his four majors, he has, he hasn't won a major since what 2014 or not? Yeah, like 2014 ha- has not won since then. And like, yeah, you can scale out the idea that that that, that, that Rory's won three of the four, mm-hmm. and Brooks has only ever won two. But like, how many guys own two U.S. Opens? How many guys own three PGA Championships? 
I, I, to be honest with you, I don't, I, I don't totally know, like, top of my head. But I think the three PGA championships, it's Tiger, um, Jack, and Brooks. Let's see. PGA championship winners. Let's see who has the mostest. I'm sure we can find them here. Um, Sam Snead has three. Gene Sarazen has three. Uh, ben Hogan definitely has has three. Walter Hagen has like five. I know that. Six, actually. Um, but like, th those also weren't, those were all like match play standards. If you look at, at like the actual like stroke play, it's, I'm pretty sure it's, yeah, it's like three guys, I think. Uh, Phil, all right, so Jack has five. So Jack's got five. Um, Tiger is three, sorry, four. And then, yeah, Brooks is three. So that's it. Yeah, they're the only golfers to win three PGA championships in the modern era. It's Tiger, Jack, and Brooks. So let's see who has two years open championships. This is also where we're kind of now now stretching out our uh, our legs and seeing who really is the best in this regard. Uh, by year, I mean, I, there is no um, differentiator or here multiples. So... Bruce Kepka has two. He's the, he's in the same category as Payne Stewart, Ernie Els, Lee Trevino, Billy Casper, Gene Sarazen, Walter Hagen, Tiger as three, Jack as four with Hogan and Bobby Jones, and then Willie Anderson as four. But Willie Anderson won them all in like 1904 when they were hitting uh, hitting like goat gut balls. So like you want you want to talk about like those? I mean, again, he has two U.S. Opens and. Rory can't say he has two. Phil can't say he has two. I would honestly, I would absolutely make the argument right now that that, that Brooks Kepka is the is the tenth best golfer of all time. And if I'm going to give you my list right now, I'd say it's probably Tiger, Jack. I would say three is Arnold Palmer, four is Ben Hogan, five is mm, probably Byron Nelson. I would say at five. Yeah, I think if you have a tournament named after you, it's six is Sam Snead, and that that's what like eighty two wins is something that like no one will ever like recover from. But he also played in the twenties, so it's like it's a little bit harder for me to judge. Um, Gary Player for me is seven. I'll put Walter Hagen at eight. At that point, it's like, do you put Tom Watson or Gene Sarazen over him? And it's it's like it's like those two, Phil and Brooks. And then Rory, like Rory's there at, at like ten, so I think 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 think, think the argument is more than uh, plausible to get made. Also, from a betting trends perspective, it's something that we need to definitely uh, follow along with. Brooks Kepka has now won <laughs> two of his majors uh, when he's gone on part of my take the day before the major started. Good to know. <laughs> I really hope my uh, my Max Homa future for uh, for the U.S. Open is still uh, is still in play because if that man goes on goes on part of my take, I'm fucked. We're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> but that's for yeah. everybody out there. We will pay attention to that for the next major. If Brooks is on part of my take, you already know who we're picking to win. Oh, mother of God! I I need you to keep me on that because no, because I will not be uh I, like I'm gonna forget this in like two weeks and all of a sudden yeah. it, all of a sudden in five weeks it's gonna be like oh it's U.S. Open time who do I take and like like I'm scouring the internet trying to find who Steve find my guy Brooks went on PMT again <laughs> the whole the universe at that point might blow up actually you know what no no the universe will first blow up if the Heat and the Panthers both win their championships because I because like honestly at that point Miami may actually like like. You know, you know the rumors of like California one day is gonna like mm -hmm. like separate. I Miami think Miami might float. Yeah, Miami's gonna float. <laughs> well, and it'll be gone you know, forever. You know the the famous dragon meme where there's the two intimidating dragons and then the one with the tongue sticking out and its eyes are yeah. crossed. So you have the Florida Marlins. Panthers, the Miami Heat, and the Florida Marlins because we do a fun bit on Underground Sports Philadelphia where we look at the NL East run differential, which went national this week because Buster Olney was tweeting about run differential in baseball. Uh, yeah, we we did it first. Um, the Marlins are 24 and 23. Can you guess what their run differential is? I can guarantee you it's in the minus. It is negative 54 
which is the worst run differential in the National League, and they are one game over 500. I mean, hey, well, they are just sitting there like. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know what? Like. G- Good for them to be a 500 ball club and have that bad a differential. <laughs> Their expected win loss is 18 and 29. That's really bad. <laughs> then, then again, like you know what? Like I'm not going to say that like all of South Florida is is like under is is, is overachieving, but um, I think every playoff game the Panthers have been in, their expect to win o meter has been like less than like 50. percent Yeah. So overachieving, maybe they also just go to OT all the time and somehow just just have magic. In overtime. So we talked Brooks. The PGA championship absolutely smacked some guys. And I uh yeah, like like upside the head, bitch slap, did a little like uh like back and forth. Uh the the best way I could describe it was like um like the scene, the the um the cadence scene of like Rocky and Rocky Four, and and it's the bag, and he's and he's just like what like all the, the like going like like back at it, and he's like oh yeah, and he just like fucking wax it and like breaks. Um, Justin Thomas absolutely falls in that boat. There were guys at, after the first day who were like eight over par, and I'm like oh my god, John Rahm is like dying after the first day. Tyrrell Hatton like great, he argues about every single course, but um, he was like seven over par, and he finished like one over, finished he tied got, for fifteenth. Which is amazing, uh, and I took him top twenty, which is amazing. I, after the first day, I go, "This guy's fucking shot." <laughs> and after the fourth day, they uh, Amanda Balionis goes, uh, "Tyrrell, how do you feel about having a really bad first day?" And you came back, you finished top twenty, and he said, "Well, they didn't fucking shoot like shite in the first day." <laughs> and I'm like, "Brother, <laughs> like, let's be honest. John Rom played worse than you, the best player on the planet." Rory McIlroy was four over for the first day. Like, give me a damn break. Yeah, no, it it, it smacked like everyone up to the head. But you know who it didn't smack? The block party. It's time to talk about talk about Michael Block. I think the think that like the story here is is fascinating, and this is this is going to be our our last bit here before we go to uh go to break. Michael Block is a forty seven year old PGA professional from Orange County, California. Now. For those of you who aren't the avid avid listener of the PGA Tour and you don't know the differential between a PGA professional and a member of the PGA Tour, one of them plays golf for a living, the other one teaches golf for a living. Uh, you can you can wonder who Michael Block is at that point. Uh, he's won multiple PGA of America championships, not the PGA Championship, but PGA of America championships amongst PGA professionals. He's won multiple chapter events, regionals in California and so on. Managed to qualify for the PGA Championship this week. He's played it a couple of times. He's only he's, he's missed the cut every time, naturally. You are you, he's a scratch golfer, but or actually he's like a plus two golfer. So like he's he, he's actually a better than, than scratch golfer. But when you're playing against the best in the world, you, your your expectation is to miss the cut. Uh made the cut. Became one of the first few PGA professionals to ever do so. And not only did he make the cut, but he went from making the field to making the cut to getting paired with Rory on the fourth day to finishing tied for 15th, bought home $300,000. By the way, it would have taken him 2,000 plus lessons to have made that money. And all on top of that, dunked a hole in one, and in disbelief, turns to Rory McIlroy on a first name basis and goes, "Rory, did that go in for the brand?" That, just like Jesus Christ, like like he, he the guy was crying uh, to to Amanda to Amanda Balionis. It was like, "This is the best week of my life." I don't think like I'll, I'll ever top this. A video five minutes later. Is the uh, the head the head groundsman at uh, at Colonial? They're like, hey, like I'm so and so, and he goes, you better not say what I think you're gonna say. And he goes, I, I, you know what I'm gonna say. And he goes, oh, how can my week get any better? And he was like, well, you can come to Colonial and you can play this week. Then the day after, he gets the call from the guys at the Canadian Open. He says, hey, come to Canada for the weekend. And he auto like, qualifies for the PGA next year. Like, dude, just what a story. Michael Block, man. Like, it, it, you want to talk about, like, the the feel-good stories. Like, they, they, there are so many human interest stories that we could talk about. 
in the golf world. Like guys who got guys who come back from like Chris Kirk earlier in the year, he won at the uh, the Honda Classic, ha- had like mental health problems, battled alcoholism, came back, managed to 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 win. Like great story. But like Michael Block should be the inspiration for every single amateur golfer and every single non professional because he went into this tournament and he and he was like, look, I'm I'm not Bruce Kepka. I'm not Roy McIlroy. I'm not going to pin hunt. I'm not. I'm not trying to win the event. And he said. And he said after he after he had made the cut, he said, "Look, I'm a scratch golfer. My goal here was to play par the entire week. He finished one over on the entire week, 70, 70, 70, 71. And it was because that damn bitch of a par three on the 11 that that John Rahm literally said, "Fuck you too." Uh, that he that he he missed out out on on even par, but like just what a story for Michael Block, but Michael Block showing everybody what they're actually capable of doing when you don't try too hard. He simply went out, played his game, knew what he had to do, and got it done, and bought home double what your typical human salary is. I think along with what the eventual get in the whole podcast Hall of Fame should be, I think every year uh, we should culminate it during a PGA season. Uh, and put together the aces of the year. Oh yeah, and then we nominate the ace of the year. I think also, and sp- and speaking of aces of the year, the fact that he dunked it makes it that much better. Oh, a hundred percent. Also, it's been a day now, and uh, somebody, one of the, I think it was actually um Gino Benelli tweeted out that they had not repaired the ball mark left on that hole. So it's still dented where it dunked right in. And and he tweeted out, he was like, they should just never repair this ever again. No. Just let it stay there. Or or you cut out the box of grass and just plaque it. <laughs> Which would be hilarious. Just like... like his whole weekend is truly the culmin. This is like Bob Iger's like wet dream. <laughs> this is a Disney movie come to life. I cannot believe um, if if my girlfriend heard you say, heard you say that she would go nuts. Like this is what Disney Channel original movies are made of. You have ah, the feel good yeah. story of the guy who teaches golf lessons. He's a PGA professional. He's living in California, you know, teaching guys. He's he's a, he's good at what he does, but obviously he's not a, a pro on the tour. And then goes to a major event, performs the way he does, gets invited to all these things. It, it's a whole Disney movie writing itself before our very eyes. It sounds like a certain decom that I know about. And can you guess what it is? Ooh. It also relates to sports, so I think it's funny how 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 it kind of it links. It isn't a perfect link, uh, but it was one of my personal favorite decoms growing up. Hmm. Sports Disney Channel original movies. The only two that are coming to mind are Johnny Tsunami and Brink. <laughs> Brink. Brink is an all timer. Uh, no, it was Eddie's Million Dollar Cook Off. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Classic. Classic, and I mean, we we own the uh, copyright trademark 2023. Getting the whole podcast, all rights reserved. The movie is Block Party. <laughs> <laughs> like Bob, Bob, Uncle Bob, come calling. We'll we'll help get it all in motion. Debating if we should have led led with, with all time famous Bob, all time famous Michaels, or all time famous Blocks. Like like the block party, LeBron's block on Iguodala, Michael Block, Blocky from Chalk Zone. Good pick. That's a good one. Uh, Ch- Chalk Chalk Zone's one of the most underrated shows of all time. You oh, can't one thousand. You can't. Rudy's got the chalk. <laughs> we're getting off. We're getting off on a tangent. When, when we come back, John Rom blasts the par three at the PGA Championship. We are going to revisit the official World Golf Rankings as Bruce Kepkin now crap the top 10. And, of course, a preview of Colonial, what to look forward to. Most certainly looking forward to the block party. And then, of course, props and beer money coming right here at the – at whoa, at getting the whole podcast. Uh, 
I'm still awestruck that you called it Bob Iger's wet dream. <laughs> That's the title of the I, episode. God, I, I'm scared. <laughs> John Ron blasts the par 311th at, at Oak Hill, saying, great effing hole, PGA Tour. He absolutely hated it. Um, I think this is an interesting little little tidbit to to hint on, because John Rahm isn't, isn't one to always like pitching moment of courses. He's done it a few times, and he's done it, done it the fact that, well, he said it um, at the rollback. He was like, a lot of these courses are, are, are getting too long. And they're and they're getting too hard, quote unquote, for for PGA Tour players, um, despite the fact that they're already shooting twenty under par. Uh, but Rom actually had I, I'm going to agree with him because he actually had a really good basis here. The par three eleventh, if you didn't know, two hundred forty five to two hundred fifty five two hundred two hundred fifty five yards, depending on, on on how it's playing in the wind. It was windy all week. Clubs um, wind in the players' faces. Guys were pulling out nine woods, five hybrids, low like two irons, driving irons to try and find this green. And on top of all of that, the green was like concrete, and it, it was not forgiving. It nothing stuck, nothing stood up. Uh, Rom had I think one birdie on the week at the eleventh. Had three up and down makes for par, uh, and almost like, like on a whim was able to to get them. Um, for the most part, was not having his week, but. I want to just point out John Rahm's uh, frustration. What do you make of his his comments? Is it is it allowed for somebody uh, of his caliber, or shut up and stroke? Hey, I mean, when when you're that dude, when you're John Rahm, I think you're able to openly criticize some things and let it be known that it's not conducive for not only yourself but you know the collective field. You know, when when yeah. you're having the voice of one of the big faces of your sport right now, kind of not thrilled with what's going on. And sure, they're professionals. They, they got to learn to adapt and everything. But when you have conditions and, and things of that nature uh, at a course like this, and you're getting those types of complaints from a John Rom, I, I tend to lean pro player. Have a Tyrrell Hatton, if Tyrrell Hatton complained about it. Yeah. Uh, I, sh- I, shut up and play. No, I think I think you know you you got to have a good balance between your your league and your players and everything, um, in terms of just you know competitive balance and and making sure you're still putting a competitive project or uh, product out there while also having things work well for the players. Um, so I think you know across the board you you got to at, at least if you're the PGA you have to listen to this and use it for your your future endeavors future uh courses and stuff like that and if you ever go back to uh a course like this you you don't do something like that on that hole who, who's the one player who can't complain um and why is it grayson murray then again he would have never made the field to begin with that's true he would have never made the cut um, <laughs> he would have torn up his entire bag on that hole <laughs> probably thrown it in the ground um Buried, buried the bag. Yeah, he would have buried himself. Um, I would say he's he's no longer on the tour, but he would have played there this weekend. Uh, Patrick Reed, I don't think has the the collective right to complain, uh, just with his track record, um, and him being a rogue YouTube commenter on this podcast. Um, <laughs> we're still we're still holding to that. <laughs> I I full fledged believe. I'm dead. Um. Who else doesn't have the right to complain? Um, I feel like anybody named like Brian. It's like what a get, what do you got against Brian? It's a very basic name. Um, I don't know. Just makes sense. There's probably some guys that you know, especially if you're a young guy too. Like you gotta yeah earn your stripes a little bit. Um, gotcha. Stuff like that, and then I think some of the old heads too. It's like, come on, you know. Look, hey, look, done look. J- Justin Rose was playing great. He was a bitch and a moan about right. nothing. So, so it, it, if the old man in the room who can't hit it past you at forty-five yards, you like grow a pair, keep on swinging it. At the end of the day, you know. <laughs> so we haven't done this in a while, and I think it's really important now, now to revisit this as. A lot of guys on the live tour uh, actually played really well this week at the PGA. Words are hard to come by. Uh, PGA Championship. It's like it's weird why I can't like speak all of a sudden. Um, some of the some of the really good movement that we saw actually this week came 
uh, from the live guys, a lot of guys managed to show up and move all the way up in the rankings. And it's going to kind of change how we view the U.S. Open when it comes. But Bryson goes from 214th in the world to 90th, which is a huge jump. Kepka 44th to 13th. Of course, when you got to talk about Michael Block, went from the 3,580th ranked golfer in the world to 577. That's a fucking huge jump. It's the biggest jump in official world golf ranking history, by the way, uh, in case you didn't know. And then, of course, Cameron Smith played played well as well. Uh, Dustin Johnson, all of them finished in the top 20. Victor Perez finished top 12. Uh, other guys, Patrick Reed finished t- uh, tied for 18th. Um, Mito came back after his his debacle last year, finished top 20 as well. Um, so plenty of guys managed to play quite well from the live side. And now it's going to really have a lot of implications on what we look forward to at the U.S. Open. Of course, they're not going to play the next four weeks as those are all PGA events, none of which will, will take place in Europe. Uh, however, now they might be cemented into some U.S. Open polls for next year, depending on, on how things go. But I want to—I want your—I want your take here. Does Bruce Kepka or should he break the get in the whole top ten? Uh, he's currently ranked at 13th in the official World Golf rankings this week. 100% should be in the top ten. Like, I think it's funny that he's not in the top ten on the official World Golf ranking. Um, you know, to to go out and play the way he did, the way he's played over the past couple of months um in pga events obviously your your majors um there, there's no doubt in my mind he should be in top 10 he should definitely be in the get in the whole top 10 um where i'm not sure but certainly breaks the top 10 with ease i still can't believe cameron smith is still in the top 10 honestly yeah that's kind of weird like that that to me is like crazy like I, he hasn't if he at least in 20, 2023, right? Uh, he missed the cut at the Saudi International, finished 34th at the Masters, and now finished 10th at the PGA this past week. But, like, aside from that, like, how is he still in the top 10? Are, 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 his, are his points from 2022 still uh, still carrying that, that much weight that he manages to still surpass He's got guys? got over minutes. Uh, c- clearly, <laughs> like... <laughs> Like the, the rollover minutes to be better than Matt Fitzpatrick, Jordan Spieth, Tony Finau, Sam Burns, JT, Colin Morikawa. Like that, that's, that's kind of crazy to me. And, and again, this is, this goes to show you how bad the uh, the World Cup rankings are. So let's go through uh, line by line. Let's see who we would pick it, pick up, pick out. Scotty Scheffler's T three this week, or so, sorry, T two. As Victor Hovland actually pushes him back to number one in the world over John Rahm, as Rahm fell all the way down with a very very rough. Uh, T50 this week at seven over the card. Uh, so Shefflo number one, Rom number two. Of course, Rory is, is in at three. Patrick Cantlay finished one over this past week. He finishes at four. Xander six, stays still at five. Victor Hovland jumps from 11th to sixth. Very well deserving uh, from Victor. Also, I'm surprised we haven't talked about his, his outfits. Like Never opinions. To impress. Yeah, he like he apparently loves to wear black. Makes sense why he because he loves fucking. Ah, music death metal. um death metal but um apparently he's he's like well jay Lindbergh just like tells me what to wear and i wear it and i'm like i feel, I feel so bad for you bro you're wearing like orange all day long he so, looks fire like he never he looks does. great he looks great but like i think he hates the clothes which, which almost makes it even funnier he's like he's, he's like he's like i want to win so i can go out on tv and go fuck this company i hate what i'm wearing if it, it, it if he could sign with like like I don't even know what company would, would just would just specialize in him wearing black. Uh, he just needs a hot topic sponsorship. True. Him and Roy Kent it just works. <laughs> Can't lay. Shoffley's five. Hovland six. Max Homa in seventh. He finished top twenty. Of course, Cameron Smith and his rollover minutes keeps him stuck at eighth. Matty Fitz at nine. Zalatoris at ten. Some other movement uh, that we have in the top twenty. Uh, Eleven through twenty. Spieth, Finau, Kepka jumps in. Burns and then JT, Cameron Young, Morikawa, and Hatton all drop one down to fin- to ranks 15, 16, 17, and 18. Sun Jay drops down down to 19, and Kirk Kitayama finds his way back into the top 20, overtaking Jason Day and Tom Kim. Is there anybody that you would remove from your top 10 and insert? Can you run the top 10 for me again? 
Scheffler, Rahm, McElroy, Cantlay, Shoffley, Hovland, Homa, Smith, Fitz, and Zalatoris. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, Zalatoris is, is bouncing for Brooks Kepka, in my opinion. 100%. I mean, um, you know I love Willie Z, but he's injured. He's not playing. Like, Yeah. That, that is an auto removal. Talk about a guy who's going to finish like top 15 this year with, because of his role over minutes, too. Oh, that's crazy. It's like, be epic. Brooks, Brooks 100% should jump over Willie Z simply because Will's not playing. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, um, like, like Finau would battle. Uh, Fitzpatrick had, had a rough week. I had him touted really high this week. Uh, he didn't do anything. My, like, I think one through five are perfect. I, I'd actually consider putting Victor ahead of uh, of Xander, but um, Xander's ha- had a really solid year overall. If I had to make any changes, though, I'd probably push Fitzpat. I, I keep Fitz- I keep Fitz at nine, move Brooks to probably eight, and then ten. I would put um, probably Spieth. Like overall, he actually had a really good week despite his d- despite his hand injury. Uh, so I, I would actually consider putting him up. Or I would also consider um, I would consider Tony Finau getting bumped up a little bit, but he actually played worse than JT, so I don't know if I could totally mm. uh, put him in that in that category. Um, other guys who who made a splash, though, I mean, uh, I mean, not for nothing. Like Justin Rose uh, got a kick up. Corey Connors as where where is Corey, Corey Connors? Connors? It's my guy. your guy. Yeah, how he only moved up one spot in the rankings yeah, is like nuts. it's shocking to me. I like better than Bradley, better than Hideki. Uh, he was he was pretty e- equal with Lowry. So those things don't add up to me. But I would definitely say Brooks will finish ten, uh, and I or sorry eighth. I push Smith out, f- fits at nine, and then ten would be B speed for me. Yeah, I can get down with that. Well, there you go. Look at that. As we push the calendar over to the Charles Schwab Challenge over a Colonial. I love this event because it was actually the first event after the restart because of COVID. Uh, Daniel Berger against Colin Morikawa. That was the that was the first time Colin had made a playoff. That was like the the introduction to what he would eventually do later on that year at Harding Park again at the PGA Championship. But that one was played much later in the year. Uh, what are you looking forward to this week at Colonial? Aside from, of course, the Blah Party making his uh, his secondary debut on on the, on the PGA Tour. Um. Just kind of the the bounce back and coming down off the high of a major, seeing how guys perform and, you know, if they're going to get up for this. You know, we've talked about this and uh, you and Jake have talked about it. You and Owen talked about it. Like, can guys get up for events coming after, you know, elevated events and after majors? Like, what's the drop off going to be in terms of just like overall production from these guys? I think it's going to be interesting to see how like the just the bounce back from uh, this weekend kind of turns out. Yeah, I think th- I think this is a really interesting scenario, and, and it segues well into what I'm going to um, bring up later on, and and I'll I'll, I'll push it in in the, in the segment. Um, the golf course is very different from what we saw at Oak Hill, and obviously a lot of the big guys are going to be playing this week. It isn't an elevated event, however, it's one of the more popular events on tour that everyone wants to play anyways because of the history behind it. So everyone's going to be um, at Colonial. You look at the uh, at the opening odds boards, it's quite clear that you already know the guys who are going to be um, taking place this week. Let's pull up the our odds board here to see exactly what we're what 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 we're dealing with this week at at the Charles Schwab. Um, like a lot of t- a lot of top names are going to be in the field this week. We've got guys uh, from. From Jordan Spieth to Colin Morikawa, they're all coming back. Homa, Scheffler, Hovland, uh, Finau. Like these guys are will all be here. Uh, n- you won't get every name, but you're going to get. But you're certainly going to get most of them, which I think is a nice thing for a event like for a event like this, where yeah, it's not elevated, but guys are going to be there. You're going to get 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 really solid um, competition this week, which I think is really kind of the um, the story here and the people that you want. Um, I'm actually also m- also most interested in seeing the guys who've actually played played poorly, how they happen to bounce back. Like the guys like the JTs of the world, and uh, those guys who finished in like the hot in the mid to high over par numbers, um, as opposed to the guys who are, who lost a shot low. We already know what to expect from them in terms of production. If you played well at Oak Hill, you should probably probably play well here. 
um, despite both courses being drastically different. You also have, of course, the challenge of travel from Rochester all the way down to Texas, uh, down to Fort Worth. So I think there's a couple of things to monitor here this week at this event to be looking at. But then also looking ahead to to the U.S. Open, the crazy part is, is that we're only five weeks away from the U.S. Open. Like, it's going to be here in a heartbeat, and you're not even going to realize it. Uh, after this, we're going to go and play at Memorial. Again, elevated event, so everyone's going to be everyone's going to be, be playing there. Uh, we have the RBC Canadian Open, which has in recent years become a, a very prominent event in, in the PGA world. Uh, it was off due to COVID, but now guys or guys will, in fact, come back to go play it. And then next thing you know, it's the U.S. Open. So you have three events people are going to be people are going to be coming out to. They're going to want to watch. You'll, Jordan Speed very well could, could be playing three straight weeks in, in some regards. Colin Morikawa could be doing the same. Uh, we'll see who who's playing at, at, at the RBC. But these next three weeks are vital for the PGA Tour because then following the U.S. Open, we kind of started hit started hit the downswing where it's the Travelers, which everyone goes to. The Rock and Mortgage is probably going to be the first true off week for everybody, considering the Travelers is an elevated event. Uh, no one's going to the John Deere because they're all going to be going abroad. They'll go play. They'll go and take two weeks off, go play the Scottish, then go play the Open. And then, then after the Open, you have two weeks, and then it's the playoffs. So not a lot of rest time for a lot of these guys. How vital is the next four weeks in particular for a lot of these players who don't really get a lot of rest or won't get a lot of rest towards the back end of the year? Um, to possibly get back into the swing of things and hopefully rack up some FedEx Cup points as we go towards the playoff push. Yeah, I mean, it's huge. This is this is one of those stretches that not only do you want to be locked in and, and play well over the next month, um, call it what it is, and it, it's going to prepare you for that, that stretch run at the end of the year when you're you're grinding and you're, you're fighting for every putt, you're fighting for every, uh, you know, getting out of every sand trap and mentally it is i think one of the most important stretch runs of the season i, I totally agree and i think like here and then the memorial are going to be the two tournaments that that, that, that you're going to see the guys who have the most lead and the most leeway to work with and like you look you look at, at the fedex cup standings a lot of the, a lot of the top players in the world can get away with only playing a, a limited number of events because they can rack up those top 20s easily like Cameron Davis, for example, right, came into the PGA, finished top ten. He'll be here this week. He'll be in the field for the Memorial. He'll be in the, he'll be in the fifth of the RBC. He's going to play every single week now down the stretch. He wants to get as close as he can to the top in order to solidify himself for the playoff run. Not a lot of guys get a lot of rest. This is going to be a, a, a incredible stretch. And I think where I do disagree with the PGA Tour's scheduling and how they don't really give give guys like in this case a lot of rest. Um, for us, at least, it's going to be an absolute showdown. I think it's going to be fantastic. Before we head over to Beer Money on the other side, I want to talk about some props. It's prop time brought to you by our friends over at Wasted Wedge. Any props you're looking into this week off the restart of the regular season on the PGA Tour? Obviously, we're on Ace Watch, and you know you want to take a shot, you got to do it with Wasted Wedge, Steve, and we got to tell everybody, our presenting sponsor, Wasted Wedge. It's a brand new way to drink shots with your friends and family when you're playing golf or if you're off the course. It's a great thing for bachelor parties, weddings, uh, everything in between. You will be the talk of the party. It was the talk of our live tailgate podcast. Everybody coming up to the table asking, where'd you get that golf club? Where'd you get that? It's Wasted Wedge, baby. They're the best in the game. Uh, and our friends at Wasted Wedge are going to provide you the opportunity to be the talk of your event uh, they're going to change the way you enjoy celebrating drinking on and off the course. And like Steve mentioned at the top of the show when we were talking about Waste of Wedge, think traditional shot ski and how annoying it was to carry around a whole ass ski <laughs> with hot glue and actual glassware hot glued to this big ass ski and how difficult it was to transport. Waste of Wedge collapses, goes right into a carrying bag and fits in the side pocket of your golf bag. Bring that bad boy out in the course. Bring that bad boy to your bachelor party, even your bachelorette party, whatever it may be. And the best part is there's no glassware. It's plastic cups. It's cleaner. People can do their alcohol of choice without having to clean the cups right after and everything. It's phenomenal. Uh, so check out their full lineup of Wasted Wedges and merchandise at WastedWedge.com. And be sure to follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Wasted Wedge 
Let them know you're coming from us. Let them know the Get in the Hole podcast is how you found Wasted Wedge. Uh, and if you happen to order anything from Wasted Wedge at WastedWedge.com, tag us, tag at Wasted Wedge. That way we can see uh, who's rocking out with our presenting sponsor. Remember the name, Wasted Wedge. Follow them at Wasted Wedge and WastedWedge.com. We're on Ace Watch every week, Steve. It's for the brand. It is of course, the brand naturally. Um, I think the other prop, even though it is kind of a – it's a beer money prop crossover – is just watching how Michael Block performs. <laughs> Can he make the cut again? I mean, uh, I, the, I'm the, I gotta find his uh, his odds to make and miss because because it's certainly something that I am I'm curious in. I mean, let's go all the way down here. I'm curious. It's funny. Michael Block actually has better odds than some PGA pros uh, for a top twenty this week. He's plus a thousand for a top twenty. My my play that not too bad. <laughs> do, 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 not do, too shabby. Do, do I play that? If you play it, I'll play it. Oh my god! Uh, you know what? <laughs> give me a beer, and I'll uh, and and actually give me a Kenny, and I'll uh, I'll 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 debate it. Uh, I have a few props this week. Um, something that I find really fun with this. First of all, um. The ace alert, it's minus one ten aside for hole in one in the tournament. I think we very well we very might will see we'll see one. We, we typically see one at this tournament um every year. If you want to go go at a certain round, uh I'll take I'll take the plus eight hundred for a for a round three moving day, easy hole location, uh ace. I think 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 that's a really fun one. I also like um this so winning margin at this golf course is interesting. Typically we, we see more playoffs at Colonial than any other golf course, uh, which basically means that plus 300 for a playoff is, is almost a go-to. Um, but also the, the plus 250 for a one-stroke exact, I think is a very solid play here. I mean, at the end of the day, plus money is, is always is always what you're looking for. Um, also, just a playoff in general uh, is plus 300. So if you could double up, will there be a playoff versus a winner in a playoff? Those are both, both odds that I would personally like to take. Um, Otherwise, those are really kind of the, the the main props that I'm going with. I, I also do like this one. It's a a tournament group prop. A tournament group prop. They've got Christian Bazaden, who K H Lee, Nick Taylor, Emiliano Grio, and Cameron Davis. Cameron Davis plus two seventy five out of that group. At, at the end of the day, he finished top ten at the uh, PGA Championship. I think he has more than a chance um, to play really well this week at Colonial. So those are the three plays that I'll go with. I also do actually like Siwoo Kim in a five-way group with Patrick Rogers, Thomas Dietrich, Lucas Herbert, and Hayden Buckley. Um, Buckley's the other guy that I would consider there. So plus three fifty for for Kim and three hundred for Hayden Buckley. Those are the, those are the two guys that I Here's will go with. Here's a fun one too. In those you, ones, Steve. Go for uh, it. This comes from a certain green uh, sports book. Winner to birdie, bogey, eagle, or par the seventy-second hole. Those are all individual props. Par. You never see guys. Yes. You yes never see guys birdie. Two fifty plus is one seventy five for par. Uh, right. And mind you, this is just for the winner to do it. Um, winner to birdie is plus four hundred for yes and minus seven hundred for no. And bogey or worse is plus five hundred for yes, minus a thousand for no. I would just go par to eagle is plus thirty thousand. <laughs> Well, yeah, because it's a because it's a par four to finish. Um, if it was a par five, I'd say maybe, but I'll go with the par. Uh, my favorite bet ever is bogey on the seventy second hole. Like winner, bogey is the last hole. It happens at every Masters tournament. I will always play that, but I'll go par uh, on this one. On the other side, we got we got some beer money plays coming right at you here on the Get in the Hole podcast. Don't touch your dial. We got a doozy to go through. Beer Money Time brought to you by our friends over at Kenwood Beer, Philadelphia's top light beer. Find them on the candy tracker at KenwoodBeer.com. KB, we got to jump right in here. Top 20 pick, or actually, you know what? Make and miss the cut at Colonial. What do you got? Uh, make and miss the cut. Oh, man. Uh, man. I totally forgot this was one of the things we do. Um, 
to make the cut, I'm gonna go. I'm just gonna like dart throw here. Uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, make the cut, Kyle Westmoreland. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Okay, I like that. And then to miss, uh, I'm gonna. I think everybody's gonna miss the cut. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Henrik Norlander is going to miss the cut. I'll take Seb Straka at plus 240 to make, and I'll take Steven Yeager, who's for some reason is, negative, is minus money to make. I'll take him to miss. I think it's an easy play. Seb played really well. He's played top 10 uh, at Colonial. Top 20 play. Who you got? Uh, plus 500. I'm going to take Cam Champ. Uh, I have two plays. I'll, I'll take Justin Suh, plus 320. Finished top 20 last week at the PGA. Corn Ferry, uh, Corn Ferry Player of the Year. I think he's got it. And you know what? Fuck it. We're going at Michael Block plus a thousand. Give me it. Bank riding it. Top ten. Where you got? Top ten. Um, I am going to go with. Where did he just go? Uh, for some reason, his name's just standing out to me at plus six fifty. Ryan Fox. I like that. Top ten for me. I will go with Justin Rose plus three hundred. Another great week for him as well. Top five. Uh, top five. We're I am rolling. going to. It it sounds stupid. It sounds dumb. I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up Owen's pick last week. Plus six fifty. Give me Ricky Fowler. I will go. I I have two. I want Hovland and Morikawa plus three fifty and plus three sixty. I think those are both home runs. Hovland's been incredibly impressive, so I want him badly. Who's your? Uh, oh no, that one. Who's your gimme this week? My gimme is going to be um, Davis Riley top 30. You're a psychopath for that one, but I kind of like it. It's good. Uh, I'm, I'm going to actually follow you up um, on your Ryan Fox play. He played so well this past week that I, I'm kind of riding the train on him. Um, where is he for a top 20? Somewhere up here. Plus 280. I like that. I'll take it. And your winner as we go. My winner ride. is going to be... Mr. Electric, Goth, Metalhead, Victor Hovland at plus 1,400. There's something amazing about this field as, as Scheffler's plus 450 and then it's Jordan Spieth at, at 1,200. Um, Texans love winning in Texas and Scheffler versus Spieth, I'll take the underdog. I'll have Jordan at 12 to 1. It's a solid play. I'll take that. I think, I think that that's all. How about it, KB? Good show. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. We are 12 subscribers as of this recording away from 500 subscribers over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at underground sports, Philadelphia, go subscribe, be a friend, tell a friend. We're trying to make that goal before Memorial day. You have a week, go subscribe and go subscribe to the get in the whole podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. It helps the show grow, helps things happen. We got big things in the works. So go subscribe. If you want to see those things come to fruition, that'll do it all for us here. Folks, KB, thanks for coming in. Been a good, been a good one. Enjoy Colonial this week, next week back for the Memorial at Jack's Play. It's going to be a hell of a ride. Take- Thanks for listening to Get in the Hole, the official golf podcast of Underground Sports Philadelphia. Catch us every week wherever you get your favorite podcasts, and be sure to like and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Get in the Hole Pod, and follow Underground Sports Philadelphia at Underground PHI. We'll see you next time, and remember, Get in the Hole!